You know what I've been doing lately? What have you been lately doing? I've been playing Hell Divers. <laughs> I don't. Oh, oh, that. Okay, yes. Everyone on YouTube's playing Hell Divers. Yeah, it's quite the. It's thing. very stressful. <laughs> I realized one of the reasons I am so bad at video games is that I will play a video game for 15 minutes, no matter the video game. I'll play it and be like, all right, I get this. And then I'll put it down. I won't need to play it anymore. I'm like, I get it. Okay. I get how it goes. All right. This is what it feels like to play the video game. Great. I was like, I was like, it's been years. I'm going to finally get into Alan Wake. So... (laughs) I get a copy of Alan Wake and I pop it on and I start playing. I'm like, all right, okay. And then 15 minutes in, I'm like, I don't need to play this anymore. I, I get it. You walk around, you do things. It's scary. All right, on to the next thing. That's, that is my attention span with a video game. So I will continue playing my my Tomb Raider uh, uh, phone game that I have. And that's the extent of my... It's a little Tomb Raider game. I used to have a Doom version of it. Now there, then there's a Tomb Raider version of it. Anything that... Whatever I can get off Netflix's mobile <laughs> apps store, I will I will play for free. Yeah, I yeah. don't do that, uh, <laughs> as evidenced by the almost 2,000 hours I have in Pathfinder Wrath of the Righteous. Oh, boy. <laughs> I thought you were going to say in Smoke Jumpers or whatever the game is called. <laughs> no, I only have, like, 15 hours in Helldivers. Oh, okay. Uh, wh- is it a science fiction game? Uh, it's basically, it's a, satir- it's, it's a satire commentary on democracy and America, basically. Uh, but it's also shoot, you shoot guns and kill. But is it set in science fiction times? Yeah, kind of. Oh, okay. Um, it's set I in think, the future. I think yeah. hell divers, I think of the people who dive into forest fires. And I, it's, it's based, it's kind of based on that. Okay. Um, basically you play as a soldier, uh, under... Um, like a, a soldier, a hell diver, uh, and you get dropped onto planets um, to eradicate the enemies of democracy, basically. Um, okay. Uh, well, it's fun. Do you know what else might be a satire on democracy and American life? I guess. I don't know. It's The <laughs> Asian Shore by Thomas Dish. I'm Phil. And I'm Willow. And it's, it's Del Toro, Del Toro time. time. It's, it's Del Toro time. time. <laughs> it's Del Toro. It is Del Toro time. Uh, yes, we are trucking, trucking, trucking towards the end of the Dark Descent. Uh, I'm looking behind myself because there might be a copy of the book behind me, but there isn't. Uh- <laughs> Don't worry, I have one right here. You have Only a... the people who watch us exclusively on YouTube will be able to see the copy of the book. And by exclusively, you mean available to anybody. It gets, I guess it is. Ex- yeah. We are only on YouTube. I have not set up a Vimeo account. So, yeah. Uh, but yes, you can watch us on YouTube if you're listening to us at home. And you could have seen Willow hold up the massive tome that is The Dark Descent. Uh, yes, we're on the last stretch of the fabulous formless darkness uh we are covering um the asian shore by thomas dish a author we have covered already we have we covered his roaches yeah which was about roaches it was about it was about a woman who could communicate with roaches and it was really upsetting (laughs) it was a genuinely upsetting story which had a genuinely upsetting comic book adaptation uh yep but I remembered we enjoyed ro- the roaches. Like it was, yeah. it was a, it was a creepy little tale, and it ended with her like calling all the roaches to her. Uh, the new superhero unlocked. As you do, uh, yeah, not unlike the movie Joe's Apartment, the MTV film about the man who has an apartment full of roaches. Uh, but this is a very different story. This is not a story of psychic powers. This is no. not a story of insect life. This nope. is not a story of a woman in an apartment. It is about a man in an apartment. The apartment stays they stays true. It doesn't take place in New York, but it does mention New York a lot. It mentions New York. It doesn't take place in America. It doesn't Do you think do you think the roach lady exists in this continuity? Like do you think all of the stories are secretly connected? God, I hope so. I hope that there is a Thomas Dish verse out there just <laughs> bubbling and percolating waiting to come to American uh, cinemas. Uh as we remember from our last discussion, Thomas Dish uh 
was a prolific writer and adventurer, and he passed away, took his own life uh, after the death of his longtime companion, his partner. I don't know if they were married or not. Uh, he had a lot of, lot of, lot of crap happened to him and exited this this world uh, uh, unhappily. And as far as I can tell from every everything everyone ever wrote, he seemed like a pretty stand-up guy uh, with a lot on his mind and yeah. a lot of very strong opinions about the way the world works. And he also wrote The Brave Little Toaster and The Brave Little Toaster Goes to Mars. Oh, that's right. That's right. That was him. Yes. A man One of- One of the most horrifying movies of all time. A man of many facets. Uh, but- We watched that movie in Minneapolis kids yeah it's a popular film and it was upsetting it's a genuinely being upsetting it's an unsettling film it doesn't pull any punches uh I mean it's terrifying especially if you are if you happen to be a toaster it's particularly frightening we all know that uh, all children are secretly toasters Put in bread, toast pops out, kids. Exactly. So this story, The Asian Shore, was originally published in 1970 in the uh, book Orbit 6, edited by Damon Knight, uh, which, which is a collection of harder science fiction. Uh, like stuff that's not really, you know, it's not breezy stuff to read. There's, this, is, this is going to be more difficult sci-fi. It actually closes out the book. So we, it's nice. This to was know. published in a book about sci-fi? Yes, this is a science fiction. Uh, I mean, because Dish was a sci-fi writer primarily. Like that's what people, that's what people think of when they think of Thomas Dish is, is science fiction. But this, this story was published in that. Yes. The Asian Shore. Not the Brave Little Toaster. The Asian Shore. Does that surprise Interesting. you? Yes. <laughs> How would you, so before we even talk about what this story is about, how would you classify this story? Depressing. Oh, really? You think this is a depressing tale? I don't know. It's just, I just, I didn't understand it. <laughs> it just uh, felt really, I read it, I reread it, mm-hmm. and it didn't become any clearer to me what the, what was the point. <laughs> Is it that you didn't know what happened or you didn't know why anything was happening? Yeah, that the second one. Like yeah. I, I I understood the sequence of events. It didn't make any sense to me. <laughs> so this is a story of of yeah, it's it's well what is our what is our pal, the late great uh David G. Hartwell have to say about this story? Like if each one of these tales begins with an introduction by our illustrious late lamented editor, David G. Hartwell, uh let us let us see what his thoughts were and why this is he the wrong in- story. <laughs> why like, what is what? <laughs> why did he include it in our book? Um I'll just read the little block of text if that's okay. Great. Because uh, I've tried to pick out segments of blocks of text and it's just, it just doesn't work. I can't yeah, do it. Yeah, and they're short. Um, this is short. Thomas M. Dish's The Asian Shore is an extraordinary work of contemporary fiction about the nature of reality, about a singular transformation that is unsettling, disturbing, and perhaps horrifying. It goes one step beyond Henry James's The Holly Corner, portraying a unique doppelganger situation that is altogether beyond conventional psychological investigation of a character. It is not a category story, neither supernatural nor science fiction, though it emerges originally out of uh, out of science fiction or out of sf where it was first published it is printed here comfortably among its kin in our third stream of horror where it represents the ambiguous boundary of horror with existential dread dish is not often mentioned as a horror writer but he has in fact a significant body of fiction in such collections as fun with your new head getting into death 102 h bombs and the novel the businessman a body of work that seems of growing importance to the contemporary horror field yeah i think that dish's horror except for the one about the woman who controls roaches with her mind which seems fairly horrific uh in the sense that she commands the roaches to kill people uh a lot of his horror seems to stem from this concept of identity futility uh, the horrors of the world. Uh, I just read uh, his story One A, which is about a, a uh, which is a short story about a, a young man who enlists in the military because that's a way to he just wants he wants a normal life. He sees his life going forward. He's going to get married. Going to have some kids. Going to get a job, settle down, be comfortable. But the first step to doing that once he graduates is to join the army. He joins the army. He's he witnesses horrific abuse at the hands of the of the drill sergeant. Makes it into the the first day of of soldiering. Stands at attention, and the entire platoon, his entire group, is just mowed down by machine gun fire by the arm, like just to prove a point. Like the army's like, you're better dead, and they kill everybody. At the end. It's a very short story. 
And it's horrific and st- terrifying at the end because everyone just dies and then it's over. And I read that and I was like, that's to me the element of horror that we're dealing with here. Like the sort of like ambiguous futility of it. And this story is nothing if not ambiguous. Yeah, I guess I guess I just don't understand it yeah. because I don't. I just I, it felt no, none of it made like sense to me. <laughs> I was like, this series of events that has occurred, I don't, what, why? (laughs) Yeah. What, why? (laughs) So, uh, would you like me to summarize it real quick? No, I can do it. Okay, give us a quick summary. What what basically happens in this story? Uh, basically, our like narrator is visiting Turkey to write a book about uh, his thesis on architecture, yes. which is basically just everything is a set of rules and nothing means anything. I guess I don't know. I didn't really get that either. But <laughs> wow! So um, if you don't if you don't get the thesis of his of his book that i can understand then why the rest of the story wouldn't have fallen into place for i you. read i tried to read his thesis six different times the ba- the basis of his thesis is that architecture is almost completely ambig- uh, uh, arbitrary because okay. once you have walls and a roof every single decision made after that is just arbitrary and pointless it's just aesthetic it doesn't mean it doesn't function in any way and so he's come to Istanbul to explore that because Istanbul is a city that a city, the only city in the world that is set on two separate continents divided by mm-hmm. the Bosphorus River. Uh, there's an European shore and an Asian shore. And it's also the home of like a million different traditions because so many people have conquered this area. Mm-hmm. And he's uh, he's going to explore that. And unfortunately, it infects his mind. And he starts saying, well, if that's true of architecture, it has to be true of life as well. Beyond survival, every decision we make is arbitrary. That's the okay. gist of I, that. Then I have to say I agree with his ex-wife. <laughs> okay, so what happens? Uh, he is miserable mm-hmm. the entire time. It becomes winter. He falls into like a depression after a while. He sees this woman and this kid. They freak him out. She starts knocking on his door every night. He spirals even more. Uh, he hits her in the face. And at some point, um, seems s- something else happens. He goes to take some pictures. He comes back. There, <laughs> The pictures are for some reason of a family gathering. I don't know. I don't know what happens. <laughs> uh, it's like you're, you're describing the story in... As if you were told to describe the story, leaving out the the quintessential points that fit the story together. The woman isn't just banging on his door. She's calling She's the be- name Yavuz. Calling... Yeah. She seems to think he is someone else. Yeah. And named... he, he, meets, he meets this guy later on named Yavuz who has the same suit as him and looks similar to mm-hmm. him. And he's like, that's weird. And then doesn't do anything about that. <laughs> His name is John, yeah. John Benedict Harris, which he keeps insisting. He's like, my name is John Benedict Harris. The gist is this woman thinks, seems to think he's someone named Yavuz. This little boy seems to think he is somehow connected to him. He doesn't speak the language, so he can't understand anything anyone's saying yeah. to him. He's completely alienated. This is a story about alienation and identity uh, in the most literal sense of the term, because as he becomes more and more, he he tries to he's trying to hide himself in the culture, which involves mm-hmm. dressing the the right way, growing his mustache out. He starts losing his sense of identity, but also wondering maybe he is this person named Yavuz. The thing with the photographs is he gets pictures developed from a trip he takes across the river. When he gets them developed, they're of a family hanging out together. The father, who is obviously the one taking the pictures, could very well be him because it's the woman and the boy who keep bothering mm-hmm. him. He hits the woman because he's freaking out at one point because yeah, yeah. she won't leave him alone. In the end of the story, he ex- kind of either chooses to or accepts his fate and becomes Yavuz and goes off with the woman and the boy. It's never explained. But that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> The whole thing seems to be a tale of exploring the nature of identity and the choices we make in the world in which, like, the the sort of duality. It's set in Istanbul for a reason. So Istanbul, separated by the Bosphorus River, set on the, it's the only, like I said, only city in the world set on two continents. It's a, it's a, it's just a split city. So, like, from right from the beginning, we have the notion of, like, these dual identities. Is there an actual Yavuz? Is it his doppelganger? Is it really him? Has 
has he actually been living a dual life unknown to himself? It's never answered. I think the idea is that we're supposed to simply consider the nature of identity. What makes us us? I think this is not a story for me. (laughs) (laughs) I think I just I when it comes to stuff like I think I just take things too literally sometimes. I also just don't get it. Okay. I just, it, I think, I think I have to disconnect myself from the logic of reality too much in order for me to understand this story. Yeah. <laughs> because it, 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 it's so disconnected from how, like, the actions taken and explained are so disconnected from how I experience life. Yeah. No, I, 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 also, I can see yeah. that. Uh, I mean, there's a lot going on. Okay. So there's a lot of incident that happens. Throughout yeah. the story, we mentioned he buys a suit at one point. It doesn't, he doesn't care for it because it doesn't feel like the kind of thing he would wear, but it's very appropriate for the area. Mm-hmm. Uh, he goes to a movie at one point. Can you tell me about the movie he goes to? I can to tell see? you about the movie. Please it's like, tell me. Um, it's like a, a vigilante esque movie mm-hmm. uh, where, oh, okay, I see the connection now, <laughs> uh, where there's a guy who is an architect um who like he seems to be in love with a woman or whatever but he's also like a vigilante or an Mm anti-hero trying to get a hold of something he kills a bunch of people but there's two in in the end it turns out there's two of them there's an evil one and a good one and it's unclear which one dies at the end and yada 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 yes uh we have actually killing kill kill i don't know if it's pronounced differently because it's a name but uh killing in istanbul or killing is yeah killing in istanbul Killing in Istanbul, the we have actually discussed this, not this specific movie, but we have discussed this character on our show before. We have? We have. Uh, back when we discussed um, uh, Danger Diabolic. Oh, right. <laughs> We talked a bit about the history of these characters, these Fumetti characters in Italy, uh, who are all descendants from an original character named Fantomas, who mm-hmm. was uh, who was an they anti. mentioned in this story, yeah. Yes, who was an anti-hero, and he inspired mm-hmm. uh, Diabolic. He inspired uh, a, 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 a criminal named Criminal. Heck yeah. <laughs> with a K. And I remember us discussing that. And he inspired this character who is literally named Killing. Why? Because he kills. Also known as Satanic. Why? Because he's Satanic. He's a man <laughs> who dresses like a skeleton. He just dresses yeah. like a skeleton. Uh, and there were a number of movies based on the character. Uh, a number of... Uh, 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 the, the, the movie special effects, by the way, uh, created by Carlo Rambaldi, who also nice. created the special effects for Possession. Yes, nice. he created the octopus monster and oh, E.T. Oh, so boy. It all ties back. We all love it. We love it. We've but officially brought it back to Guillermo del Toro. We've officially brought it back to our friend Guillermo del Toro. Uh, he's a costumed vigilante. Not even a vigilante. He's a costumed antihero. Yeah, uh, I love are, antiheroes. They're fun. These are criminal characters who do what they do, just like Diabolic, do what they do for kicks and money. Yeah. And yes, in this movie, there are two killings, a good one or a bad one and a worse one and yeah as you said in the end you're not sure which one it's left ambiguous because he doesn't speak the language and there's no subtitles Mm -hmm. it's ambiguous to him whether or not the bad killing survives or the worst killing survives and i think that is very telling when it comes to the end of this story like who is who is walking away at the end with the woman and the child? Is it Yavuz or is it John? Somebody who needs significant mental health help. This is a story that could take place all in this guy's head. Or, you know, it doesn't all take place in his head, but the perception could all be in his head. Uh, mm-hmm. Presumably this woman exists. The yeah, because per- she's interacted with other people before. Okay, okay, I can't uh, remember. She, he, goes, he goes to a cafe. Like, the first time he hears her knocking, he goes to a cafe, and she's knocking on the window, and a person goes out and he's like, go away. Oh, that's <laughs> like, right. That's you're disturbing right. people. <laughs> but again, she shows up at his house almost every night at 10 o'clock, and for 30 minutes, knocks on the door, calling this guy's name. Yavuz, Yavuz. And no real person would do that, right? No. Like, that's no. not the way a person behaves. They would escalate or they would give up or they would change their tactics, not just constantly knock saying mm-hmm. one name over and over again. So there is like this surreal quality to her 
Yeah. Yeah. And he, he first encounters her at a at a at a fort. Like he's mm-hmm. he, he does a he's... lot of uh tourist stuff. Yeah. Uh he because he's he's trying to see the architecture so he can talk about his thesis. He yeah. he's going like down a walkway, um, or like a path or whatever, and it's like a, a narrow path only enough for one person, and he steps off to the side so the woman can pass him. Yeah. And that's the total sum of their interaction. And he like interprets like a million different things she does. She sort of cause he's like, Oh my god, she didn't cover her face when she walked mm-hmm. past me. That's weird. But she kind of did and then she kind of looked at me in a certain way which maybe have meant this but like it's as far as we know it's just a woman walking up a pathway yeah uh, and he sees her later on from like up on the fort and he's like oh, she's waving to me or, or is she or i don't know and i always i've often wonder while reading this is there actually a woman coming to his door banging on the door like after i don't that- even i don't think that she was even at the fort the second time hmm because there's no proof that she was. He, he takes a bunch of pictures, but he can't get the film developed because it keeps like breaking. Yes, he keeps break. He keeps ruining his own film. Yeah. Uh, um, he first encounters the boy when he's in a city, and he the boy is hauling this, water in bare this feet. Scene so bad. <laughs> and the little boy is obviously asking for help. Yeah. But he's like, I can't talk to this boy because I don't speak the language. I don't want to interact with a child in a weird, in a foreign country and have people like think it's weird. So I'm just going to back away. And There's just get somebody else. <laughs> the little boy's like. Ah. Yeah. The now, little boy is like clearly in pain because uh, he's he's trying to pull water and he's it's winter. He only has flip flops on. He's spilling yeah. water on his feet. He can't feel his. <sighs> but also. That may be his son. Yeah. Asking his father, what are you doing? Like, daddy, daddy, what, hell, what, what's happening? Why are you backing away and like or acting like a weirdo? his son thinks it's that he's his father. Or he thinks it's his father. Because I don't, there is, in my mind, there's no way that this man is actually the guy that they think he is. Why not? Because he has an entire other life in the States. <laughs> well, that's why I was like, because there's so much le- like left out of the story. I'm like, did he go to Istanbul, have like some kind of a psychotic break and like start a new life? See, that one could make sense. Eight years ago, I guess. Like, we don't know how long he's been there either because like, he refuses to f- write his wife, who he has yeah. left. I mean, they're split up. Janice. Janice. Because uh, she, he wanted to go to Istanbul to work on his thesis. And she was like, first of all, no, what do you yeah. mean? Uh, also, I completely disagree with your thesis. Yeah. And they were, and he was like, well, I'm going to go. And she's like, I want a divorce then. And he keeps sitting down to write to her, but he's like, ah, no. So for she all- writes to him, though. That's she, true. She gave him a, a Christmas postcard and he got a letter, uh, sent, like a clipping of a, a review of his book sent to him. Oh, that's true. That's true. Um, which he like responds to later on in the story. So it can't have been that long. <laughs> it can't have been that long. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it, it's a weird story. It's a surreal mm-hmm. story. Is it a horror story? I mean, that's a stupid question. Clearly it is. It's in a horror collection and it's labeled horror by many people. Uh, but I just, I don't feel the horror. I just feel sad. I just feel depressed. <laughs> I mean, sadness and depression are horrific. I guess if it feels more like a tragedy than a horror to me. Tra- tragedy can be horrifying. <laughs> yeah, but it but the like genre. I guess this he does say this is not a category story. <laughs> He does say that, yes. Yeah. You can kind of you can yeah. kind of feel uh 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 David Hartwell like hedging his bets on this one. Just like, look, I find this horrifying and Dish has written some horrifying stuff. I'm including it here at the end. I can see why it would be included in this collection because I do think that it is a piece of the development of horror. I just don't consider it in it of itself to be a horror story. It is it's like to me if you have if if categories exist on a continuum, mm-hmm. you know, and on this end is like I don't know, the the bloody skeleton with the claws that drips acid and murders babies story. And on this end is like... I want to read that story. (laughs) Is like, boo, a Halloween ghost, a pop-up book for two-year-olds. And along this continuum is like horror. I feel like this falls... I don't know if I would consider it a binary line though. it's not a binary line it's it's yeah. it's 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 all over they they go all over the place i guess what i'm saying is it's very far in one it's it's like here are the elements of this mm-hmm. some versions of this story are far more clearly horrific 
like yeah in their implications this one i feel is very far on the like vaguer end of the yeah. of that line i think i think i didn't feel horrified by anything that happened in this story it just felt sad <laughs> maybe the real horror is that poor boy's feet yeah, I mean, that's like the only part of the story that I was like, oh, yikes. Except for the part where he hits the woman across the face. He does hit the woman across the face, which is uncalled for, but also he's going insane. I can't tell. It's this terrifying... Uh, to me, this is the scariest part. Is He's he's trying to catch a fairy back to... Yeah, that made me feel a little like E. The he's Euro- trying to get... Yeah. yeah. He's on the... Euro- he lives... His apartment is on the European side of the, of the river. Mm-hmm. Hence the Asian shore. He keeps seeing the Asian shore. And he's crossed the river. And now he's trying to get back to the European side. But he keeps missing... Like things keep occurring that cause that him to... felt like a dream. The entire last segment of the story felt mm. like like a nightmare that he had while he was sleeping on the ferry to go to the other side. You know what it felt like? It kind of felt to me like the ending of Brazil almost. Like that. Oh, yeah. Things just kind Which of. Which also felt like a dream. <laughs> well, yeah, it is. It's yeah. literally a dream. Spoilers. It's, it's a dream. It's a dream. Uh, yeah. uh, but it's. It is that sense of like things are getting weirder and weirder and weirder, except in this version, he doesn't wake up and he's just like, I guess I'm a Turkish guy now. Yeah, I I guess I feel like I feel like the ending of this story is a dream. It Mm. just feels like a nightmare to me. Um, Like the whole segment of it, like even him like leaving because he isn't supposed to be leaving yet. It feels like he got drunk in his apartment, which he's been doing. He fell asleep and now he's dreaming this entire last segment. The real question we need to ask at the end, though, is what does his new wife think of his thesis? Probably not much. <laughs> he can't talk to her. Yeah. That was also a weird part, like the, the weird weird part of the story to me, because that was anxiety inducing, just not being able to speak the language at all. Yeah. It is I, very, it's very yeah. much a story about anxiety, too, mm-hmm. like, and being trapped. But he's not even trapped in this. He chose to come here. Yeah, he chose to come here and he could literally leave at any time. That's true. That's true. But he doesn't. Uh, he doesn't. Sorry. Um, Sorry, John. Yeah. I mean, he, in the end of the story, he's not even referred to by name. He's just called the man. Who? Our main character. Well, he's called John. No, the end of the story. Uh, the man oh, was you're right. at the woman who mumbled right. a few afterwards of Turkish. They set off as they had so many times before toward their home. The man leading the way, his wife and son following a few paces behind, taking the road along the shore. So it's not even clear if it's him. Right. So there's <laughs> a lot. It's not, it, it's not him at the end. It's whatever weird thing has happened to him. So there's a lot to be said about the story and the themes of like cultural displacement, mm-hmm. uh, self, like not self image, but like self like the sense of self, I guess, who you are. Uh, I was worried when I first started reading it. it these, these worries were assuaged. I was worried that it was going to be one of those stories that sets our protagonist in a foreign land, especially in the East, mm-hmm. and then over exoticizes, like makes that the horror. Like you're yeah. in this crazy world that no white man can understand. And it almost starts doing that until you realize that, like, no, Istanbul's fine. It's our protagonist that's got the issues. And yeah, you know what? I figured. It, I just figured out. I'm having the same reaction to this story that I had the first time I saw Rosemary's Baby. It made me incredibly uncomfortable, and I can't. I'm not like processing that. <laughs> it's an uncomfortable story. I like that he makes a friend. He has this one friend who I kept thinking was going to end up being a weirdo. But he and wasn't. He was just a nice guy. He's just a guy who literally helps him like buy a new suit and barter with people and figure mm-hmm. out where he needs to go. But you kept expecting this guy to turn or be or punch be a Peppa Pig. I just punched you. Peppa Pig. <laughs> And no, and I, I think that's what I mean when I say like, this doesn't turn as as much as Istanbul is a character in the story. Mm-hmm. It doesn't turn Istanbul into the villain. He's not trapped. Like we, we said, he's not trapped in Istanbul. He's not done in by the city. He's just a man who has no sense of identity anymore. Yeah, I think I'm not sure there is a villain in this story. <laughs> yeah, except for himself. Yeah, well, even him, like even himself, I don't think. I don't think he's really a villain. I think he's right. incredibly mentally ill, which I mean, just breaking down his actions that led him into this situation. He completely uprooted his life 
uh, divorced his wife all to chase a thesis that kind of made him spiral into, like, a mental breakdown. It kind of seems like he's a guy going through a lot at his time. Like, it kind of feels like a midlife crisis, almost. <laughs> it is the worst midlife crisis. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he's having the worst midlife crisis. And and I think that that's not even a joke. Like, mm-hmm. I think, because what, what is a midlife crisis if not a person suddenly going who even am i yeah like why do i exist do i exist or is every choice i've made completely arbitrary yeah. would it matter if i suddenly decided i was a turkish man named yavuz and went off with a woman i'd never met because that's as art that's just as specific and meaningful a, a choice as every other choice i've made in my life and isn't and I, that i hate it i hate that line of thinking <laughs> i think it's dumb <laughs> <laughs> because you know it's true. No. Because I you think... know it's true. You could be in Turkey right now. No. Uh, I think that what really irks me about this story is how far removed it is from the way that I view life. Yeah. Which makes sense. And it's good to challenge myself by reading stuff like this. It just made me very deeply uncomfortable, which I guess it's supposed to do. It's supposed so to su- do that. It's successful story. I won't be reading it again, probably. <laughs> I also think it might be one of those stories that makes more sense in the context of Thomas Dish's mm-hmm. body of work. Like if you read a bunch of Dish and in well, the even um, after here, like remembering that he wrote the Roaches this, or whatever that story is called. I think it's the Roaches. Mm-hmm. Um, it makes more sense to me. Mm. Um the because that story was also it, it the, i can see the con, like this is a similar like connections and themes between the two stories yeah i feel like in order for me to fully grasp this story i'd want to know more about dish yeah well I'd there's a lot to, like, to know yeah. about him he wrote so much there's so much dish out there yeah. uh i uh, think that this these this story would be really good to talk about in like a class Oh yeah. Uh oh yeah. The like a, a class on on horror, a class on mm. science fiction, a class on Istanbul, a class it's just on a class on literary theory. On literary things. Yeah, it's just yeah, it's 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 a very talkable story. Uh, and it's not it's not terribly long. I thought it was going to be really long. No, it was a quick read despite like it was long. Like it's not like super long, but it was long. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a it's a novelette or a yeah. whatever. It's it's broken into chapters again. I like yeah. when stories are broken into chapters. Yeah, easier to keep track of. Yeah. It's about uh, twenty five pages long. Well it probably comes as no surprise to you that this story's never been adapted into anything. Wow, really? <laughs> it's not a not a not a single ding dang thing. Uh, uh, you're going to have to just pop in your video. The brave little toaster goes to Mars again. If you want to catch any more dish on screen. Um, yeah, I think that somebody could do an adaptation of this story. Yeah. You, you would just have to get your, you'd have to really film in Istanbul. I think just yeah, to make I it think, authentic. I think that this is a very adaptable story, which is, I, I don't say about a lot of these stories, um, but it's so much, this is about a man. It's not about a monster or anything. It's about a man. And I think that, I think film would be a really good way to adapt this story. All right. Well, get to it. No. Got, get on that. I want to see it. I want it on my desk by tomorrow at 3.30. Main character played by Chris Pratt. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> uh, well, speaking of Chris Pratt, what is the next story in The Dark Descent? It's actually a Garfield cartoon, believe it or not. <laughs> no. Uh, he hates Mondays. A, he loves lasagna. It's uh, The Hospice by Robert Aikman. Robert Aikman's Garfield in the Rough. In the which hospice. John, Garfield, and Odie go camping, and they're chased by a panther? I think that's what happens We've in that story. We've read a few Robert Aikman stories in here. We have. We read Larger Than Oneself. Mm-hmm. We read The Swords. We did. I think that's it. Yep. Yep. There's at least one in each book. And I think I've said each time to live like the Ache Man, to be like the Ache Man. I don't think you've uh, ever said that. I have said that to life. myself many times. <laughs> Uh, yes, he wrote Larger Than Oneself, which remains one of my favorite stories in this in this collection, mm-hmm. and The Swords, which remains a story in this collection. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, next time we'll be covering our final Ache Man story. Well, what's For it now, called again? What's it uh, called? The again? Hospice. The Hospice, which uh, is an intriguing title. <laughs> it is an intriguing title. Two more stories, and then we're yeah. done with this. Co- can you believe it? No, I can't. It's been literal years. It's been literal years. It's been literally been years. Because we started this during COVID. 
It's we still did. Dur- we, st- we started this during the beginning of the pandemic. We did. And now the pandemic is, I guess, still going on. But we're almost done with the stories. So yep. uh, then we'll move on to movies. And who knows then what we'll the go future. back to stories. Who knows what the future will bring. You know what I got a copy of? What? Uh, that Guillermo del Toro book we were talking about. The Chuck Hogan, yes. Guillermo del Toro one. I got a copy of it up there now. Heck yeah. Did you, so, get, did you get the copy of the book? that i wanted to. has not come in yet so all right. we're waiting i'll probably be in on sunday when i go to work so all right we'll see what happens yeah. uh this is this is personal talk with willow and phil i talked uh, about hell divers at the beginning of this episode so that's true that's true a game i still know nothing about except that it is a game and i will never play it it's uh, fun. I'll, I'll play it when i'm done with alan wake 2 which is a game <laughs> i don't even own so uh but yes you can also listen to my shows deep in bear country or Pizza Toast, which will be coming back shortly. Uh, but we are, this, this is our show. It's Del Toro time, right up there above my head, Look if you're watching us. on YouTube. Uh, so uh, thank you, everybody, so much for listening. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll be back with more exciting spookiness in Hopefully. the future. Hope I don't know if this next story is scary. Uh, I, I wish, yeah, this, this story upset me. <laughs> and made me want to hate it. So, congratulations. We'll be back next week with Boo, a Halloween ghost, a pop-up book for two-year-olds. Uh, yep. But until then, I am Phil. And I'm Willow. And we'll see you when it's, it's Del Toro, Del Toro time. time. Bye.